Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Please, uh, let's get seated and started. Okay, I want to do a little recap of what we were talking uh, last time, but before that, I should go over a few things I had shared with you over the Canvas announcements. First, uh, last week, I have provided you feedback on your projects, and you should all have seen those by now, I hope. Uh, if you have any questions, please let, please let me know. I am traveling this Wednesday and the rest of the week, so I won't be able to have the standard office hours. And honestly, I won't be able to meet with you because I will be attending the events uh, for the whole day. Uh, but uh, if you need to talk to me about your projects or anything else related to the class, we can arrange um, a meeting early next week before your uh, two week reports are due. So please let me know. And of course, Piazza is always there. So if you can you know, uh, write to each other, that's always an option. Um, I also shared you today a paper we are going to discuss next. And I also introduced a few changes uh, for the paper discussion, having in mind what you had shared with me in your mid-course feedback, namely to have more or less less of those presentations and uh, kind of prioritize wildcard roles uh, and so on. Um, so there is an announcement about that. So if you haven't seen it, uh, check it out. Okay, um, trying to remember, did I forget anything? Do you have any questions? Yeah, please. Interesting lesson for the scientific peer reviewer. Yeah. We're still putting in our slides into the normal presentation so that the original presenter can use the yeah, slide, yeah. visual presenter class, right? Got yeah, that's uh, that's uh, right. And um I mean the alternative is that you have write the review and put it in the folder, it's just easier for me to navigate who sees what. So don't worry about the presentation style since you won't be presenting and so um, if you are, for example, writing your review in a Google Doc, you can just copy paste bits and pieces into your presentation. Would that work? Yeah, so just some more yeah. no, uh, concerns. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And instead, as I said in the announcement, uh, when the original author stops their presentation, you have kind of reviewed their work. So you probably have already some questions in mind clarification questions, and also you have identified some weaknesses, and then you can initiate the conversation about those uh, things. So I will expect you to be very active in the discussion that follows after the original author's presentation. Yeah, and of course, please uh, don't get to, to review your tomb, always be polite, and uh, you know, uh, this person playing the role is just playing the role, so they, they don't know the, all the answers. Okay, will that work? Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, with all of that, let's uh, let's continue. So last time we were talking about different levels of the evaluation, and I was saying how um, in NLP at least, we had a lot of functionally, functionally grounded evaluations and some human grounded uh, evaluations. And the issue with these evaluations is that they're not directly testing whether our explanations fulfill the function we introduced them for. Um, and we said we need more application grounded evaluation, evaluations that directly evaluate the uh, whatever motivation we had behind our uh, explanations, which are usually tied to some exact, very concrete purpose uh, in the real world. And we said, okay, if the, our, our explanations can fulfill that objective, that's a very strong evidence of success for those explanations. Everything else, if we get success with human grounded or functionally grounded evaluations, there is always going to be a question of whether that success transfers to a real world situation. Um, and then we went on and I gave you a few examples of concrete application grounded evaluations, which were all uh, put in the context of human AI teams for decision making, meaning a human, a person such as doctor, a journalist, a fact checker is collaborating with some tool and together in the, through this collaboration, uh, the person is making a final decision for whatever is the task at hand. For example, whether a claim is true or false if the task is fact-checking. 
And then we uh, had um, learned about few measurements relating to these human AI teams, namely uh, the notions of reliance, whether the person is rejecting incorrect model predictions, meaning that it uh, doesn't have high over reliance or complementary performance, where we wanted that our human AI teams are better than just a human alone or just a model alone. And we wanted to boost uh, in that complementary team performance from explanations. And then I mentioned self-reported confidence uh, and trust. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about next is given that we have this setup, we have these measurements, what kind of tasks are appropriate for evaluating these kinds of measures? The first property we want to have is that this task has some kind of meaningful connection to a real world application that involves people who actually seek outputs of the model to do certain action with it. So we had, I had at least shown you a lot of tasks that do not fulfill this criterion. Namely, we have talked about natural language inference, the task of predicting whether a hypothesis is true, false, or neither given another sentence that we call premise. And usually the sentences were really broad and basically measured our ability to have some sort of very basic logical reasoning, such as if we know that three dogs are uh, on, a, on a train tracks, uh, can we determine that three uh, cats are on the train tracks? Based on the premise alone, we would say this is contradiction. But it's not like we as people ever need the automated prediction of the relationship between these two sentences I should have just given you. We simply know what the answer is here because we have that ability to reason logically about these simple situations. Similarly, at some point I'm giving you an example of common sense QA where a task is given, um, given some questions such as where is in frisbee in play likely to be air or ground, you need to make a prediction and give explanation for it. You and I know that the answer is air, right? Uh, these kinds of data sets were designed to test models ability to reason about common sense situation, but you will never go and be curious about what the output is from a common sense QA model because you don't know what the answer is, but you do need it to do some action. Does this make sense? Okay, so NLI and common sense QA, which are two most investigated data sets for explainability in NLP, fail this condition. And I don't deem they are good data sets to study application grounded evaluations of explanations. But some data sets are less clear and I still deem them to be inappropriate because they do not fulfill this criterion. So for example, there is a lot of science exams data sets in NLP where you have a question, you are given a few choices and then based on these few choices, you may need to make a decision what the true answer is. The issue is here, I think, is that imagine a situation where the output of these science exams would be useful. You have a new question and you do have those multiple choices and notice having multiple choices presumes that you basically know what the reasonable choices is. So you kind of know what the real, um, you know, you kind of understand the task well, but you do not have the correct answer. I think you have these kinds of inputs if you are preparing for exams and usually those prep exams come from maybe some textbook or something that comes with the correct answers. So here we have this um, kind of dissonance that we have these inputs, but we don't have correct answers, which I deem to be unrealistic. So the point here is besides that you need to have a real world application, and people see, seek out, outputs and acting on them, that you really need to think deep whether your application makes sense. And sometimes it won't be uh, as clear cut as with NLI and common sense QA. So that's the first condition and it seems very basic, but a lot of NLP data sets did not fulfill this criterion. And remember why, last time I told you that 
for a while, these things simply were not working. So we narrowed our scope to something really, really narrow, something we understand really well, like common sense QA, something that we can easily evaluate to have this proof of concept designs for our expl explanation methods. But now that's done. We know that we can build an explanation method and it will work to some extent on NLI and we need to move to these application grounded evaluations. So yeah, I don't wanna to be too judgmental because there was a good reason why we didn't just jump into real world fact checking right away. The second property is that the data set inputs must be realistic. And this is also the byproduct, not fulfilling this criterion is a byproduct of researchers needing to narrow their scope to be able to actually do something, to implement something that at least work in this niche domain. So for example, in natural language processing, we have a lot of fact checking data sets. But a lot of these fact-checking data sets were framed in a way that's not realistic. Namely, people who developed the data sets, again, for a good reason, because we couldn't do stuff, had um, developed a task where given a fact-checking report written by a professional check, a fact checking, fact checker, excuse me, I wanted to say a fact-checking person. So a professional fact-checking report been written by a fact checker that gives the veracity of the claim. You strip the veracity and you just leave the document. And based on that document, you, the model needs to make a prediction. To me, this is not realistic. If you need to verify a claim, and obviously you will first thing you will do is search in, for example, Google. And if there is such a report, it will immediately pop out and then you do not need an automated uh, fact-checking system based on a black box neural model. And more so, if, um, if this fact-checking report will have this very explicit mentions of why the person deemed that this is true or false, unlike when you start doing fact-checking from scratch where you need to first got, gather documents that are related, then from those related documents, you kind of find snippets that seem to be most important for you to decide whether a claim is true or false. And only based on that, you actually make the prediction of whether a claim is um, true or not. So when you start to work on a task, you have determined, okay, fact checking, pretty realistic application for a human fact checker and AI to uh, collab collaborate on. Oh, great, there are some data sets I could use to explore this. Think deep whether those inputs make sense for your realistic expectations, because they might not, because we had this stage where we had to develop things that work in these niche domains. Does that make sense? Okay, so we need to know that outputs of a model are wanted by someone uh, and we need to imagine that people can act on those outputs. For example, if you have a sentiment classifier, knowing that the review is positive or negative, I might decide whether I will book a hotel, buy a laptop, buy some beer or whatnot. However, if we are in this setup where we have human AI teams, then, um, and we want to measure something uh, like reliance, we must actually rely on that thing. So if we know the task really well, imagine sentiment classification of a single sentence, such as this laptop is amazing bias. We will all agree that's pretty positive, right? So we immediately know that this is what the, what the sentiment of this very short review is. And if a model gives us whatever, we can just ignore whatever output the model is giving here. And we don't really need to rely on anything because we already have a great understanding of what the, what the label is for this task. So the, this mix of having great performance, our human performance on the task, and also inputs requiring no effort to read means that this human AI team collaboration simply doesn't make sense. So if you have chosen a task like that, task with very short texts where people are excel at solving the task, 
then there is no necessity for your human AI teams and your setup is flawed. So to have proper collaboration, uh, one of these two things must happen. We might be bad at it. For example, we are notoriously bad at detecting AI generated text, no matter how short it is. So shortness here doesn't matter and the effort doesn't matter because we are simply bad at it. However, if we have a task we are good at as for example, certain sentiment classification, not all, some, then uh, we need at least to have effort for this collaboration to make sense. Because if reading the input takes you know, 15 minutes, we can do only four instances of this task in an hour. And that's maybe not sufficient for the needs we have. And this is commonly cited in medical domain where there is a lack of human resource. Okay. Um, let me just see whether I have, okay, I have already told you this. So the questions here are how to determine if a task requires effort for people and how to determine if a task is easy or hard for us. And this is not something that is easy to determine. This requires a lot of thinking, I would say, and I don't have a great solution for you, but I do have some suggestions. For effort, I think there are two factors here. Your input might be very low. So this is an example of a claim verification task where you need to verify a claim that comes from some medical domain in the context of scholarly papers. A claim here is something I can probably cannot read. Let me see. A high micro something common risk vulnerability to severe anemia in homo something alpha. I can't even say these words. Okay, so there are two factors here. It is long, so even if I knew what these words mean, it would take me a while to actually read this entire text. But also this is a difficult domain. So you have two aspects of that. Um, and I would say the difficult domains plays more into the role of the task being hard for me rather than this requiring effort. But maybe even for you know clinicians, there are different levels of clinicians. Maybe you know doctors that are specialized in anemia will immediately read this and be like, yeah, duh, and no problem. Uh, but maybe a nurse wouldn't be, read this text super quickly, but uh, unlike me, at least uh, this person would have some understanding. So I think effort can be to some extent approximated with the length of the input. Although I don't think that's a perfect solution because sometimes you can search for keywords and despite your input being very long, you can maybe quickly localize what is the most relevant part. So nevertheless, I think if the length of the input is at least to some extent tells us that there might be some notable effort for a person in this interaction and therefore doing the task like this in this human AI teams makes sense. Question about this effort approximated with long inputs. Who hates this idea? Yeah. I, I was just going to ask, uh, if we talk about, I think this is like part of the business, mm -hmm. I'd say probably it is. Do you think you are next to it? You probably can read a lot of it. But how how do you feel this? Because yeah, I mean, I think it is useful. You can imagine, and this is just my subjective, you know, uh, impression of the task. But I think it is useful because you can imagine a doctor who is deciding on a treatment for their patient, and they might have certain questions in mind whether, you know, this factor might be increasing this other thing in certain ways, which these claims in this data set there is. Uh, a lot of them that are in that spirit. So I think to me, this task is closer to what I would deem to be a useful task. Now, do I have a reference where an actual clinician said what I just said? I do not have that. So I would take what I said with, a, you know, with caution.
Okay, so in long inputs are part of it. Then the second property I said is that the um, task must be hard for us. And um, in this, one way to think about hardness of task is to go to the original paper that had introduced the task and data set and check what is the estimated human performance. Very often papers do come with those estimates because then that gives the upper bound for the model as well. Natural question is why 100% is not the upper bound. Very often the portion of our data has either some subjectivity or it's maybe mislabeled or something. So there is always a portion of the data that prevents us from reaching 100% human performance. So usually you would see something like here where you have, uh, for example, here human has almost, um, I would say 87% percent accuracy in sentiment classification here a little bit lower I think 80 82 so you know upon seeing that you can say well this is pretty high you know um okay there are some errors people make but in general this is high um so est estimated task hardness with the estimated human performance I think it's not a crazy idea and I think that gives us some at least compared to two tasks, if in one task human performance is 60 and in another it's 80, you can say that this uh, first one is uh, harder. However, I would challenge my own thinking here because in this paper, for example, despite the human um, performance being uh, rather high, we do see that in human AI teams, uh, the performance can increase by, you know, 80-ish um, percent or here, uh, I would say maybe 5%. If, sorry if I'm not reading these uh, right because they are uh, far away from me. Um, so despite the performance being hard, human AI teams still have makes sense here because the, the there is an improvement from teaming relative to uh, human performance. And remember, I'm telling you that the, the task should be hard because then human AI themes make sense. But here we see the evidence that despite very high human, relatively high human performance, there is still uh, room to improvement. So if you were to ask me how to estimate effort, I would say a good place to look is the estimated human performance. But if you're looking for a magical number, I can tell you 100% for sure can't be improved, you know, more than, we can't get the performance that's higher than 100%, but very often estimated human performance will not be exactly 100%. So whatever that number is, is it high enough to say the task is easy for people? Uh, it's very hard to determine. And that's the difficulty of figuring out whether the, you know, the whether this setup uh, makes uh, sense. However, if you have a collection of the tasks, and you can say that the estimated human performance of some is lower than the other, yeah, then I would prioritize those tasks. So I think that's the takeaway I want for you uh, to remember. Questions about that? Let me just go real quick. Um, another thing I wanna point out here is that and maybe I will mention later in the slides, I can't remember, is um, that when we have tasks like these, for example, where it's obviously in certain domain like healthcare, uh, here we might have different level of experts. So the human performance will also change. And there is a question, if you use, you know, if you are teaming with just lay people here, then the human performance will probably be very low here. And then uh, human AI teaming, I don't know whether it will make sense because maybe AI will be way ahead of your lay person on this task. Um, so thinking about who your experts are, who's who, if we are talking about estimated human performance of who are the people whose performance we are estimating is also uh, a good question. And I also think it's a very important if you, for example, get very high performance uh, on a task like this, uh, it might happen so that if you, that the human estimated human performance is high when we estimated uh, using people who work in without any time restrictions. But if we introduce time restrictions, their human performance might be uh, notably lower. So, you know, checking who the experts are and in which kind of setup we are estimating their human performance is uh, very important. 
So I think it's easier to achieve this condition. People are bad at it if you are having these more restricted setups. Okay, um, so we have three uh, criteria for choosing a task so far. Uh, we need to have outcomes of a model that people won't actually want to use to do something in the real world. And we don't want to like stretch our imaginations to see that. We want to have something that we can imagine a substantial group of people would like because we don't want to spend resources where we will have help like a small group of people. Um, I mean, you know, this is a little broad, broad statement. Of course, if you are working on a rare di disease um, diagnosis, then that group is small relative to, to the whole humanity, but that makes sense. Anyway, I digress. Um, the second property is that the inputs must be realistic as well, which, you know, um, it's kind of hidden that <laughs> this might not happen, uh, I think, because uh, you are very rarely taught to look at the data carefully, and I hope by now you are looking at the data carefully. And finally, we have seen that we need uh, to either have a notable effort or people who are not good at the task for the collaboration to make sense. And finally, uh, these three criteria are necessary if you want to study reliance or complementary team performance. The following criteria is not required to study reliance or complementary team performance, but we deem that this is still an important property that we want you to prioritize. This property says uh, it is related to studying uh, human trust in AI that I will go very in very details um, in the rest of this lecture. And the, we will see when I come to that part that the definition of human trust in AI requires that there is some risk involved in this uh, interaction. Without the risk, there is no question of trust. Like you can't talk about trust if there is no risk. It simply is not a well-defined idea then. So some undesirable uh, event must occur if we want to study uh, trust. And in this criteria, we say, uh, that we do want this uh, this possibility of such event to be occurring in the task we look at uh, ahead. Um, so just to, I don't have a slide for that, but just to recap why we want that. Um, then the questions of reliance and complementary team performance become more serious, right? Uh, if you have something bad that can happen in this interaction, whether your person relies or not, uh, appropriately on this uh, system is has a greater implication than if you have uh, a task where the risk is, okay, a player will lose some game, but nothing really bad will happen in their life. Uh, so that's one reason. Uh, and explanations when you read how they are introduced in the literature, very often people will say in high stakes situations, it's important to do this and that. And then there is no high stake task that we are actually studying. So there is, that's one reason. Um, the other reason is, uh, if you remember, I mentioned the uh, work by uh, Denwell last time, where I said that they had introduced that strategy-based reliance. And they basically said, um, you know, um, yeah, um, that if your model is highly performing and outperforming human, then uh, the question of over-reliance is not interesting, just a question of under-reliance. Uh, and this is kind of tied to uh, tr trust and undesirable event as well, because if your model is really, really, really good, then the probability of your hazard happening is really, really small. And then if the probability of a hazard happening is small, then, very, then we would say that the risk is not huge as well. So, that makes these, um, yeah, basically, yeah, it's not interesting to study everything we want to study with low risk tasks. So I'm going to give you an example of uh, a task that fulfills all the criteria. And um, I also want to mention that in this work, we have subjectively determined the, uh, the risk, the level of risk that we can happen interaction by thinking about what is the hazard that can happen, what is probability and what is severity. So let's look, 
look into that through this task. This task uh, is um, requires that a model gets a case proceeding document from the Supreme Court of India, and it should predict whether the claims filed the, by the petitioner against another uh, person or entity should be accepted or rejected. So basically how it works, a person or an organization entity goes to the Supreme Court of India and says, okay, we deem that um, this uh, person organization entity had violated certain things and we want you to um, consider our petition and you know decide whether this is truly the case. And then uh, there is a proceeding where someone writes all the notes, but it's not a nice structure proceeding where a person, I like that fact-checking report where someone already structures the most important information. It's just a non-structured list of notes. Um, and these notes are pretty long. They can have more than uh, 3,000 words. So this is an example where the effort is really high. However, the expert accuracy is also pretty high. So we, again, I don't know whether 90% is now large enough to say that this is a task where experts excel, but it is reasonable to say that they are not terrible at it, right? Um, so having long inputs here is really crucial. Otherwise, we would have that situation that is unwanted with this short sentiment classification that I have mentioned before. Okay, what is the application? It's AI-assisted judicial uh, decision-making. And uh, what can happen? What kind of hazard can happen here? We are going to look into that from the perspective of in people who are immediately using this technology and from people who are impacted by whatever decision people who immediately use this technology make. So here, uh, people who are going to use this immediately are the uh, Supreme Court's uh, legal professionals. And their hazard they can make is to accept a claim that should be rejected or reject a claim that should be accepted. And what is the probability of this? Um, we can determine that by checking what's the best model's performance right now. And if the best model's performance is not sufficiently high, we can say, okay, it is moderate uh, uh, likelihood of this hazard achieving. So having a hazard that has a severity that's actually we deem high, because if someone says, hey, you violated, let's say my human right, and we say, no, you're a fine. I mean, that's pretty severe, right? And then if the probability of that is not low, then together we have a high level of risk. Um, what's the, what about the downstream impact? If the, there is a high risk of uh, this happening with immediate usage, that will mean that the uh, risk for the downstream um, uh, people is also likely high. So here we have person who had, you know, made a petition or a person or entity who about um, you know who, who the petition is about and um, maybe then we will wrongly say to a person hey you violated someone's human rights that's really bad or uh, other way around so again because the probability is moderate and severity is high we have higher risk over here um, so this is how you can, you know, think about your own tasks and applications that you are interested to bring explanations for. I think this is really important. These are the steps which have been completely, I wouldn't say ignored, but not prioritized in the prior work. And that has led us also to the situation where we don't have this application grounded evaluations, where we don't have any strong evidence that explanations are truly useful for these kinds of tasks. And because we don't have that strong evidence, righteously so, people have said, well, is explainability then a false promise? Where is the evidence that is actually helpful for the situations we care about? Um, it is the most central question in the explainability world right now, to find a way to demonstrate that explanations are actually useful in these situations. If you're working on something that's not a great, very different explainability method that hasn't been proposed before, uh, or a new application that hasn't been explored before, people will raise the question of why do we need more of the things we have seen. So working on answering whether explainability is needed for something like this 
is I think better use of your time if you are thinking about working in the space. Okay, questions about this? Uh, I feel like I'm coaching you, <laughs> totally imposing my opinions right now. Yeah, please. Um, so I'm kind of wondering how you could get labels for cases like this, like mm -hmm. with that or your of stuff that maybe is even not 100% accuracy for expert mm -hmm. in that domain. Like how, I guess, how, how could you ensure that you're even correct? Like say you're doing a diagnosis. Yeah. And you're using like medical expert diagnosis mm -hmm. for, for your own label. But yeah. I mean, maybe... Well, yeah, right? that's that's completely true. And when you look at the, this is the average accuracy of the experts. They have actually used five experts, and then you can see there is a range between them. So not all of them were this uh, much accurate. So when you are collecting the new data set, and um, here they had access to the proceedings, and they also had the, you know, um, the decision that whatever you know legal professional has made. So they do have the you know, inputs and what could be deemed as a gold standard. If you have enough resources, a typical thing to do is then to hire a few more legal professionals that uh, check whether that they agree with the uh, decision here. And then for a portion of your data, you will have agreement that's not sufficiently high for you. And you will say, this data is filtered out and we remain only with the data that is have a, high level of agreement amongst people we have annotated. And this is not just the case for these high stakes um, data sets, but also for any kind of data set. Yeah. Okay, so um, kind of to wrap up. So these three first criteria, as I said, they you need them to go about measuring reliance. If you, and a complementary team performance, if you want to measure those things, but one of these things is not fulfilled for your task, then you have a flawed experimental setup. And that's the worst thing that can happen if you are writing uh, a paper. Um, and then this one, I said, well, this is not crucial to, you can still measure reliance even though your task is low risk, but uh, we deem you should give precedence to this task that are having some um, higher, moderate to high risk involved with them. Um, under and over reliance have more pronounced consequences for such tasks and uh, boosting appropriate reliance for these kinds of tasks um, is very often how the explanations are introduced. And also if you show that positive and strong evidence, then you did way more to your community than if you had shown the same thing for a low risk task. Okay, so that's basically it, or it's not, seems like it. Um, because now I'm a little bit like preaching, oh, you should be prioritizing these things. Uh, I want to also point you to these two papers on how good uh, is NLP and uh, you know where NLP lies uh, in terms of social good. Uh, very often you will see a little bit of virtue signaling in a community where people will be like, I care about social good. And then it's not really reflected with the things we have been doing. Uh, so these are some things that you might be, you know, thinking a little bit about. It relates to this idea of, okay, I might use a low risk task, but I decided to prioritize the high risk task because that's where I can do more positive things for the for the world. So I think it's worth to check out uh, these papers and think about these things a little bit, but not super directly related with these criteria. Okay, so. As I said, uh, this Wednesday, we will not have our in-person class. I do want you to uh, go to this uh, tutorials, chapter three, and I want you to watch the videos for part two, three, and four here that talk a little bit more about the experimental design details. If you are going to go about doing some of these human subject evaluations of uh, reliance and complementary team performance, uh, they also show you some uh, use cases 
Um, and maybe think about everything I said, because some of the things I have sent kind of are updated version of what was that said there. So you might notice, so oh, the instructor said that, um, I don't know, human performance and AI performance should be similar to who for human AI teams to make sense. And you might see that somewhere uh, in these uh, presentations, that's not achieved. Uh, watching these three parts should take you about 30 minutes. So I recommend that you use the remaining 15 minutes of the class time to work on your projects. I do wanna remind you that the two week report is on November 2nd, which is about 10 days from now. So the time will pass quickly. Uh, this room will be available. So if you wanna you know, meet here with your uh, teammates, uh, I think that would be a good time uh, to spend on your projects. Okay, any questions about what I was talking about so far? Yeah. So I have a bit of a sidetrack, but as you're talking about the Union Supreme Court, for example, it occurs to you there's two different interests involved here. Mm -hmm. The applicants want their application to go through, and the Supreme Court wants to be able to effectively filter out the one that should go and one that shouldn't go. What happens if both groups create AI-assisted uh, mm -hmm. programs to help with those two competing tasks. So we now have an AI trying to optimize the applicants to get through, and that would be continually competing against mm -hmm. another AI that's trying to effectively discern between all of these applications. And there's very much research that looks at mm. and has two misaligned AI systems. I am not aware of it. I think that's a very interesting uh, idea. I think one kind of like trivial thing to do here is to have human AI teams for, you know, different incentives. And um, maybe each one of them can be improved knowing what the other one is doing. So if uh, let's say the uh, court AI is open source and you really want to make your claim you want, really want to tailor it such that your claim passes, you can maybe use, you know, the outputs of the court's AI to kind of tweak your own. I think there is something there for sure, but I am not aware of work that has done something like that. Yeah, I will, I will check, but I, I don't, I, nothing comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Although it sounds like some kind of AI wars as well. It's just like, ah, no, please, peace. It's like a very real world example. Of yeah. How might be applied in the future. Like we're in a certain medical setting. Everybody's invested in one out. Yeah. It seems like in other places, it's more adversarial. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm working with uh, a surgeon at the hospital here, and they want to build a triage system. And they say that currently the way that the triage of emergency room surgery works is that everyone pushes everyone pushes their own patients, um, and there isn't much of you know reasonable way to go about this. And this reminds me of that. Like you have different people trying to you know prioritize their patient in this output of a, of a model as well. So yeah, I agree with you that these are very so realistic situations. Now I'm thinking about it, does remind me a little bit of adversarial attacks where you know you have a system in mind and then given that system, you want to tweak your input such that the output is desirable for you. Here, the output would be, uh, yeah, approve my petition, right? So that's a little bit uh, connected, but yeah, adversarial attacks where you have human AI teams, um, and explanations involved in it, I, I don't know how all of that would fit together. Okay, um, so now um, for, I wanna start talking about trust in AI. Most likely I will not finish talking about human trust in AI, uh, but I do wanna start with um, these snippets. And uh, these snippets all, are saying something along the line that a key motivation of explainable AI is to increase the trust of users uh, in AI. However, this, this is a bit vague. It reminds me of, you know, reading, you're giving feedback to someone on their text and you're like, what are you actually talking about here? 
It's super unconcrete. So when you read this, it doesn't really tell you what do you need to achieve to have human trust in AI. Like what needs to be fulfilled for a human to trust AI? And it doesn't tell you what we need to do to, uh, to, to uh, doesn't tell us what we need to do to increase that because we don't know what's even required to increase human trust in AI. And we also don't understand very well for what goals trust exists. Like why are we trusting these, uh, these models? And why should we research AI that people uh, trust? So what are the goals here exactly? So I really want to warn you that this part is going to be a little bit intensive. Uh, every time I talk about this, I feel like brains are melting and yeah, I don't want you to die here. So if you're feeling sleepy, now is the time to kind of come back because otherwise it's going to be terrible. And uh, this whole thing will be uh, um, basically overview of what we have presented in this FACT 2021 paper where we started with this um, idea of, okay, let's formalize what human trust in AI means and let's just stop writing that bogus big sentence. And to understand what human trust in AI is, it makes sense to look at what, you know, what interpersonal trust is, to how, why people trust each other and what we do, what, what is needed for human to human trust. And then given that idea of human to human trust, we can bring it into, you know, framework where we have actual machines and talk about human to AI trust. Okay, so we start with how is uh, interpersonal, uh, interpersonal trust defined. And for that, we go into the literature from sociology, psychology, and philosophy. And we find a definition of interpersonal trust that might not be perfect, but it is a definition which says, if a person A believes that person B will act in A's best interests, and act A accepts vulnerability to B's actions, then A trusts B. That's a definition from the literature. And the goal of trust, having belief, here that the A is going to act in, uh, excuse me, that B is going to act in A's based interest and accepting vulnerability to B's action um, is to anticipate the impact of someone's actions on us. And the ultimate goal of this anticipation of other people's uh, you know, actions on us is to make our lives more predictable and therefore more efficient. I think common example of this is uh, crosswalks, right? We have agreed how we are gonna behave if we have traffic lights and we know what to anticipate if there is a red light for the cars and you are a person walking across the street, you know that the car should stop and you are, you believe that the person will stop and you accept the vulnerability, which is really bad that this car doesn't stop and hit you. And the, this, you are doing this because ultimately you want to cross that road. And if you never trust anyone to stop, you will likely won't cross that road and you will never come home. Okay, so in other words, um, interpersonal trust exists to mitigate uncertainty and the risk of collaboration. And I just mentioned a very important term here that I have kind of mentioned before, and that's risk. Risk is an undesirable event to a person A, which can possibly, but not certainly happen as a result of interacting with uh, another person B. So if you're a person A, pedestrian walking across the street, person B in a car stopping at the traffic light, you know that this person could potentially decide not to stop and hit you, and you are aware of the existence of these undesirable events, but you know that it doesn't need to happen uh, necessarily. So admitting vulnerability to other person's action is to perceive that this event is undesirable. You understand that this can happen, and you uh, understand uh, not only that it's undesirable, it is possible, and you will then, when we talk about trust, accept vulnerability to this event. 
So I said before, we don't really know what the prerequisites for the trusts uh, are, but I just told you one. It is risk, right? There needs to some there needs to be some notion of undesirable event for whole this whole thing about trust to be uh, you know uh, to exist. So if the risk is prerequisite for the human to human uh, trust, we, the authors of this paper, we have uh, decided, well, we deem that this is also true for human to AI trust. So we expect that human trust in AI exists for the same purposes as interpersonal trust, and therefore risk is a prerequisite to existence of human trust in AI. So if you go later on, and you want to evaluate trust, we deem that that doesn't make sense if you are having a collaboration with, where there is no risk involved. You cannot measure and talk about trust if there is no risk. So that's why, you know, if you are going to go and do this evaluation of self-reported trust, you should really have those tasks where you have some notion of risk. Okay, so, so far we established that the goal of trust is to enable the trusters ability to anticipate uh, AI's actions. Um, but we didn't really say what the human truster anticipates in the AI's behavior. So that's what I'm gonna, gonna uh, talk about uh, next. What does this kind of thing is, you know? And I can't even give you an impression of what this is without actually going into the details. This is how these things are actually, we, I can throw so many words at you and it will sound reasonable, but when you really stop and think about what, what each one of these means, it's you, you will quickly stop and be like, okay, I don't get what this means. Okay, so what are we trying? What, what does uh, AI need to do here? So, or in other words, what is AI being trusted with? Um, and before I go into that, I will show you an example. So um, this is also very common to see that we want to enable people to, uh, we want to increase their trust that the model is correct. We deem our model is correct and we want to increase their trust uh, that the uh, model is correct. And that again is not well specified. And we bring this um, illustration in the paper. So imagine we trained a neural network for the task of, uh, I think, spam classification. And uh, we set some hyperparameters wrong. We probably all know the story of your performance. It's terrible. Your model is behaving completely randomly. It's like randomly initialized network. It doesn't do anything. Um, and we can expect that the person will not trust this model because it's not correct, right? We might have another uh, situation. Um, let me see. Okay, in this other uh, situation, we have actually trained our neural network decently, but it happens so that every time uh, your network sees a conference update, it sends it to spam and everything else it uh, you know does correctly. So it predicts almost everything correctly and conference updates is completely misclassifies. And let's say for the sake of this argument that your 50% of your emails are about conference updates, which sometimes honestly feels like uh, it's true. So this model will also behave seemingly randomly, right? Because you have 50 of these, 50, 50, 50 being um, conference updates that the model cannot handle well. However, if we had some kind of interpretability tool here that highlight that is that the model is actually accurate unless the email is a conference update, a person might trust this model is a more correct despite these two models having exactly the same accuracy. They are 50% accurate, but we can maybe trust this model more because we understand when the model is correct or not. So what has changed between these two uh, model instances that have same performance, but get different levels of trust from us is um, the following. So we are not trusting that the model is correct. In this situation, we are trusting that the patterns that distinguish the models correct and incorrect cases are available to us. So 
This is why we trust the second model I show you and why we don't uh, trust the first model I have shown. It is a little bit convoluted example. I, you know, I'm sure you are a little bit uh, already feeling like it's hard to follow, but what's uh, my actual point here is that you need to be careful what are you specifying uh, a person should trust. Specifically, if you go into the literature in sociology, philosophy, psychology, um, you will find that a notion of um, contractual trust or a, uh, of a, or a trust with a commitment. Contractual trust is when a truster has a belief that the trustee will stick to a specific contract. So we are not talking about this broad notion of trust in every single thing. We are talking about trust in a specific thing or a specific contract. And um, regardless of what this contract um, uh, is, uh, we deem that to discuss human trust in AI, we do need to specify that contract. We can't just say we want to increase human trust in AI. We need to specify in, in you know, human trust in what exactly. So this needs to be clear. And as we have seen with that example, with conference updates, it can be really finicky, right? Um, obvious question you might have, well, what is the contract? And the contract may refer to any functionality that you deem useful, even if it's not concrete performance at the task that the model was trained on. So to kind of make that a little bit more concrete in this paper, uh, we went to the uh, European uh, Union uh, or European Commission that has outlined what should be required from AI from these models to be deemed trustworthy. And uh, this is a this is kind of like an overview of everything that's written there. Uh, in this first uh, column, you have European Union requirements. And in this paper on formalizing trust, we said, okay, this might be a good place to derive your contracts, right? Uh, if these are requirements, each one of these strings can be a specific uh, contract. And um, in NLP and vision and other AI related fields, uh, it became very, um, it, it has been argumented really strongly that we should document our models, our data sets, our evaluation metrics way better than we do. This started all with data sets because people will just develop data sets and write their own paper and then they wouldn't specify so many necessary details. And it started with, we should really start documenting all of those details and proposal for that is called uh, data sheets or data state. And then after that, the others had emerged, such as model cards uh, as well. People train models. They forget to mention bazillion hyperparameters. I want to replicate the model. I cannot do it because I don't have the details. So the, uh, the notion of, hey, let's start documenting the details of our models had also emerged. And what we said in this paper is, OK, if this, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I guess I this perspective stuff and divide these things into like simple cases like let's say you can say a legal agency mm -hmm. it is very straightforward like everyone should have fundamental rights or that so it's yeah. not to feel good but for the cases like where people don't necessarily have a consensus how do we define like risk and even really like what, what is being risk worthy for the mm -hmm. and what is not for example platter some of the matter we have for the side yeah, that's a great question. If you open the actual European Union requirements guidelines, they will say that what we deem should be requirements is something we have to decide on as a uh, you know society. So European Union has its own guidelines, which are way stricter than what's allowed here in the US or in China. So different countries already had decided they have different ideas of what is trustworthy. I think that goes, you know, at the level of how any government decides what the citizens should do, right? Uh, and citizens will disagree as we all have learned during COVID, right? And there might be disruption and there are standard ways how to deal with destruction from protests to 
uh, whatnot. So I think this is very much tied to that whole thing that, you know, to anything that we decide as a group, uh, group of people. And of course, I as a citizen might, uh, you know, not agree with how my government is applying AI to me, for example, with facial recognition. I think it's super important and this is a huge discretion, but what I have noticed is that people have this strange belief that they cannot participate in these core conversations. In the end of the day, we live in the democracy. And if we really hate things, we have the right to you know, influence how these things will uh, be uh, affected by us. But what's happening these days, and I don't think you are the crowd that does that, but on average, a population feels like they are just helpless with, uh, you know, terms and conditions. Uh, I don't have a choice but, you know, to click. And that's true, but we all have a choice to protest and say, no, give us minimal changes of the terms of conditions. Or, you know, the way that facial recognition is applied to us, people are like, oh, I don't have anything to hide. But then, you know, uh, people who were protesting women marches couldn't enter the White House to get certain celebrations, for example, for them, for their own achievements. So yeah, this is a huge digression, but I think it's really important to understand that we all have something to say uh, on how these technologies apply to us and that these requirements are not set in stone. Like this will continuously evolve. So if you notice something you hate, you should definitely you know, make a, make a fuss. Uh, about it. Yeah. So aligning AI to like trustworthiness in this case that we're talking about is just like a general thing. Because I was also kind of wondering the same thing. If you try and make something trustworthy and you buy the basis mm -hmm. of the exaggerating bias of like the standard series. Let's say no. Um let me see whether I understand that right. So you're saying, okay, if we are kind of aligning a model to be uh, closer to what the person believes, that yeah. might exhibit whatever bad belief they might uh, be having. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think here, when we talk about contracts for, you know, the, the way I think about it is we design contracts for a group of, for a large group of people, let's say for sick people who currently live in the US, something like that. Um, and here, if you have an AI that should be useful to all of us, I don't think that you can tailor it so hard to you know specific group of people. Like it cannot be extremely liberal and just uh, you know uh, repeat whatever would the most liberal people say, because most likely that wouldn't be useful to the other part of population. Well, I, I'm, I'm just saying maybe more like just that it looks at biases and maybe the way the questions are worded or something. So you're talking AI and it can see like just little biases that maybe mm -hmm. you wouldn't, I wouldn't even notice. Yeah. Like just, just little things that apply like, oh, I just don't think you're looking for this kind of answer to respond to their question. So I uh, just mean to get, to get to your training like trustworthiness. Yeah. So, um, okay, I wanna bring a few definitions because there are two different things at play here. So I will define what's trustworthy and that's gonna be property of a model. And then human trust in AI is something that a person can have. Um, if, you, if your person deems that, no, I do not, you know, a large fraction of your people do not want certain whatever outputs to ever be output, be it uh, subtle biases or, um, whatever, something more harmful, like, you know, straight up um, hate uh, hate speech or something like that, uh, then if you have a train your model that doesn't fulfill that contract, you would say that the model is untrustworthy with respect to that contract, and then the human should not trust such a model contractually. And we'll come to that, those definitions uh, in a bit. Uh, but yeah, you can definitely specify everything you just said as a contract. You know, your contract can be a model should not exhibit subtle, passive, aggressive comments about people. And then you can go about checking whether the model is trustworthy with respect to that and whether people trust that the model will not do that.
Okay, so um, just going back to what I was saying, we have these requirements that we might or agree or might not agree with. And then uh, for each one of them, uh, in this paper, we say, okay, there are these checklists that can uh, help us specify uh, more concrete contracts that all relate to this um, um, requirement. Because, you know, accountability, we will not have a single big contract that says whether something is accountable or not. We do need to break it down into smaller factors that can actually be tackled and uh, evaluated. And one place, just to make it more concrete, I'm not saying this is your solution. This is more about where to start to think about these contracts. You can think about a bigger contract being one of these requirements. And then uh, these um, documentations that relate to those contracts can give you speci specific things to require more like subcontracts re relating to this contract. And then we also share what kind of explanation methods might be helpful to achieve that, um, you know, to, to help with guiding that trust in this certain contract. And important bit here is that one explanation type is not your full-fledged solution. Not Sometimes you, um, maybe I have an example of, for example, there is a method where you can analyze individual neurons in the network, meaning individual, you know, parts of smaller units of your whole transformer. And by doing so, you might find that, oh my God, my transformer is mega redundant and I don't need all these parameters. I can actually learn the task with like 20% of my parameters. And that can encourage you to find more efficient and more green solution to your problem, which would be related to, um, here, societal and environmental well-being. One of the uh, kind of factors is encouraging sustainable and eco-friendly AI. But analyzing individual uh, neurons will hardly be useful for uh, you know achieving universal design, which is uh, somewhere else uh, in this table. Let me see, can I find it? Uh, no, I cannot. But universal design is somewhere else amongst these factors and it's a part of another requirement. So not every explainability method can help you with guiding the model and guiding people um, with respect to all of these factors. And that's something to have in mind because machine learning people love universal thing, model agnostic thing, slap it and it works for everything. It's just not the case. Okay, and then, you know, um, I, I said that when we talk about human trust in AI, we should talk about contractual trust, uh, but we could extend this idea of contractual trust into something more broad. And that can broad trust can be built on many contracts, each involving many factors and requiring different uh, evaluations. And this image comes from the uh, requirements uh, in from the European Union. And then themselves say here to be continuously evaluated and addressed throughout the AI system's life cycle. So it's not like one time you said it and then um, it's done. However, if we are you know developers of explainability methods, most likely we will not talk about this broad trust because we will likely not in a single paper find a solution for every single one of these big requirements. So although if you really want to talk about trust, you can refer to something like this. I recommend sticking with that contractual trust with almost everything uh, you do when you are talking about explainability methods. Okay, so trust, as mentioned, aims to enable the ability to anticipate intended behavior through the belief that a contract will be uh, uh, held. Um, and this kind of specify what kind of goals the, um, the trust uh, exists uh, for. So trust exists to see whether this uh, contract is upheld or not. Um, However, I want to highlight uh, the following. It is possible to have the belief uh, that the model will do the right uh, given a contract, but we actually do not really know how to anticipate AI's behavior properly. So we say, oh yeah, I trust it. And then someone gives you an examples to test you and you're like, Meh, don't really know and completely fail. So this kinds of situation um, occurs. So, 
me just saying I have this belief doesn't mean that my belief is warranted. Uh, another way around, uh, we might be able to figure out when the AI is doing right for the contract, but we are really stubborn and we are like, not, we do not want to believe it because we simply hate technology and this belief doesn't exist. So these kinds of things can happen. We cannot assume just because one thing is happening that the uh, other thing is going to happen. And I don't think this really involves AI, but I think it's a nice example uh, to, uh, to show uh, how these things may happen. So here on the left, we have some kind of interface that clinicians are using to see uh, information about their patient. And the, on the right, we have the same content just represented very more nicely. We see way less text. We have graphs instead of these uh, ugly tables. Overall, it looks more uh, pleasant. And uh, these clinicians were asked to do whatever decision they needed to do for their uh, patients. So not, not, no, there was no AI involved as, uh, as far as I know. And what has happened is that this nicer interface um, made them uh, self-report way higher confidence in their decisions, but they were actually making um, decisions that were not more accurate. So, these doctors don't have a better ability to anticipate whether they, they are making correct predictions, uh, but these beautiful tools make them believe that they, they do. Uh, and this happens when you have AI involved as well. You include some nicer interface and then the perception of people of how they are engaging with the system uh, is um, you know fooling them into thinking they are smarter than they are. I don't know whether the solution is to make ugly tools, I don't think, because <laughs> that hardly makes you more efficient. So we need to have more efficient you know, interfaces as well as uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate self-confidence. OK, so how do we differentiate from the trust that succeeds um, at the goal of enabling appropriate anticipation of AI's behavior from the trust that uh, does not. And now I will throw a bunch of definitions at you. And I think, although this is very boring probably to listen to, I think this is mega useful because this gives you actually concrete definitions to, uh, to work with. So uh, when I ask you what human trust in AI is, you can give me something more concrete. We'll start with separating trustworthiness from trust. This is a very common mistake to think these two things are the same. We say that AI model is trustworthy, so it's a property of a model regardless of a person interacting. It's, it's just the property of a model, no people involved. And we say that AI is trustworthy to a given contract if it's able of maintaining that contract, so more or less if the contract is, uh, the model is not biased, um, then uh, model is trustworthy with respect to not being biased if it's really not biased. Now, human trust in AI is a property of a, of a human. Human has a trust, not a model. And we say that if human perceives that AI is trustworthy to a given contract, and accepts vulnerability to its actions, then the human trusts AI contractually. And otherwise, human um, trusts, distrusts AI contractually. Again, the contract may be any functionality you deem useful. And important to observe here again is that trust doesn't exist if human doesn't perceive risk. Because if there is no risk involved, then there is no condition of accepting vulnerability to actions since there is no vulnerability that can happen. So it's just, it's not like there is no trust. The question of trust is not a well-defined question if there is no risk. And so I, I mentioned, I brought the question of how do we, do we distinguish trust which succeed in anticipation from that that doesn't. So we don't want, people to trust AI always. And I think this is this is the issue with a lot of works that have um, stated or asserted that claim that I have shown you in those snippets where you are where they say we want to increase trust. They just assume that the model is trustworthy 
and that people should trust it, I believe. Um, however, your model can be untrustworthy and your people that you are developing technology for uh, can um, have a human trust in it. Sorry, we are not done. Can you come a little bit later? Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so human trust in AI is warranted only if AI is trustworthy to the contract. Otherwise, we say that the trust is unwarranted. So if I believe AI that's not trustworthy, we are talking about unwarranted trust. And our goal should be to increase warranted trust and to decrease the unwarranted trust. Or, you know, uh, other way of saying is uh, you can um, um, increase warrant, excuse me, increase warranted distrust and decrease unwarranted uh, uh, di distrust. So the notion of distrust is also interesting. It's just that I believe because machine learning people are evaluating this and we really want our own technology to, you know, to succeed, we have hyper focused on the increasing uh, warranted, I mean, not increase, increasing trust, whereas where we assumed it's, that means increasing warranted trust, but actually we might have increased unwarranted tr uh, trust. So I will try to finish with where I started, although I do want to try talk about trust more next time. So I sh have shown you these uh, snippets and I have told you that very often people will assert that the motivation of explainable AI is to increase the trust of users in AI. So now let's see what with these new definitions, what does this mean? So we are crossing out increasing the trust of users in AI and we are replacing it with we can use explainable AI to increase the trustworthiness of the uh, of the AI. So, uh, for example, um, you might some people have uh, used uh, learning from explanation framework to make their model performance better. So, if your contract is that your model uh, is uh, correct, then by using explanations, you can make your model more trustworthy. Uh, similarly with adversarial training. Adversarial attacks, if, are, if they are method of explainability, we have learned that if you train with your attacks, then you have a better model that is more robust to the adversarial attacks. You can also use it to increase the users, uh, the trust of the users in a trustworthy AI. So not in any AI, AI that's trustworthy, and you can use it to increase the distrust of people in a non-trustworthy AI, all corresponding to a stated contract, not in general, but to something specific. And we want to develop warranted trust or distrust of people in that contract. So very short phrase, <laughs> increase the trust of users in AI, became a, a substantially longer list if we specify everything precisely and correctly. Okay, so here uh, I have shown you situations that might be um, unwanted. And this uh, situation here where you have a belief but you don't actually recognize the model behavior properly is uh, something that's related to unwarranted trust. And when we do actually have the ability to anticipate what the model is doing but we just do not have the belief then that's a lack of warranted trust, or we can say unwarranted uh, distrust. Okay, so that's been a lot. Next time, we are going to talk a little bit more about all of this. Namely, we are going to uh, cover what factors lead to trustworthy models being trusted. We just learned that people might um, not perceive models that are trustworthy as trustworthy, and we are going to talk about what enables that step where people actually perceive them. Uh, is trustworthy.